I'm coming to kind of explain what we've done in the healthy eating space and what events are coming up that other people can plug into. So for starters, for those who are not fully aware of the, the breadth and depth of this office, we have done a lot in the in this space of healthy eating. Um, so for starters, who here has heard of the Bellevue Plant-Based Lifestyle Medicine Clinic? Okay, so about a third of the room. So about a year ago, we launched a clinic with Dr. Michelle McMacken, and we thought that this clinic would have about 100 to 200 patients sign up. Well, we have 650 people who are waiting to be served a plant-based regimen. So they are signing up for this program, and the program is walking them through how does one transition to a plant-based diet um, to reverse their diabetes, to reverse their heart disease, et cetera much of what we're going to learn tonight from Dr. Dunayev. So that has been our crown jewel, and we're very much looking to expand that program as the program is having people reverse their diabetes, reverse their heart disease, as is kind of common if you follow this, this sort of regimen. We have expanded Meatless Mondays. We started with a pilot project of 15 Brooklyn schools. We are now citywide with our Meatless Mondays in schools, but we've also expanded Meatless Mondays to all hospitals, and we're working on all jails, all homeless centers, and all daycare centers. So those are coming up through the pipeline. For processed meats, I know many folks are aware that we as a city are moving away from processed meats, which WHO says is a class one carcinogen, so there is no world in which we should be serving these meats to our students. Um, but now we're also going even further and pushing different nonprofits. We're pushing the Food Bank of New York City, pushing City Harvest to say that they won't serve processed meats either. While we're waiting for the USDA's dietary guidelines to catch up with science from, a, uh, from the data that was released in 2007, we'll wait a little bit longer, but we're not going to wait here in New York City. We're going to kind of plow ahead. We here know that this is a this plant-based regimen dietary pattern is good for health for sure, but it's also good for the planet. So about last week, we had a op-ed released in the Hill down in D.C. Uh, kind of cataloging why it's good for the environment and why we really need Congress to take it more seriously as well. So if anyone's looking for that link, uh, come up and find me after, and I'll I'll shoot it over your email. We have put millions into urban agriculture. So for those who are not aware of our capital expenditures, we've actually put about $20 million into greenhouses, into hydroponic labs, trying to get people to, trying to get students to grow food. If they grow the food, they're more likely to eat the food. And we want them to be eating more fresh fruits and vegetables. So we definitely are putting our, our money where our mouth is. So in terms of those upcoming events, we have a few uh, that should be on folks' radars. So we have a health expo that we are partnering with the Seventh Day Adventist Group. Um, that is in a month. It is September 18th. We have our we have a meditation training that is uh, a part of a healthy lifestyle as well. Um, so we have a meditation training for principals and teachers on October 8th. We have our quarterly vegan meetup. So while this event, we have partnered with the NYC Vegetarian and Vegan Meetup that is officially on meetup.com, we also host quarterly uh, vegan meetups. And that is, the next, one, the next one is Monday, November 4th. And that will focus on teaching folks how to move away from the standard American Thanksgiving to a more health-promoting Thanksgiving. And then we are partnering with Hip Hop is Green on a healthy, uh, healthy eating hip hop rap, bot, uh, rap battle. Um, so Hip Hop is Green will be taking over this space. Um, and we're, for the next three months, we're going to work on getting uh, different daycare centers, different after school centers signed up for this as well. Um, so with that, I wanted to, one, turn it over to David Green, actually, in case he has any announcements about the meetup. Um, do you have any announcements? This is, this is his show, actually. Nope. <laughs> no meetups. Everything you can find online, I'm sure. Um, and are there any questions about Burl Hall, anything in that realm? The next vegan meetup. The next vegan meetup is on Monday, November 4th from 6 to 8 p.m. And that's going to talk about Thanksgiving. Focus on that.
Yes. September 18th is the health uh, ex. September 18th is the health expo. Yes. Um, so this will be a uh, out on the plaza actually, just behind Burr Hall. And they will be giving out vegan food samples from uh, Heidi's Health Kitchen. Um, there will also be, um, let's see, it's saying uh, blood pressure screening, body mass index screening, natural remedies, lung capacity, massage, health age assessment. So it's going to be pretty comprehensive. They are doing a really good job of, of building, it, building it out. Any, oh, this event? Uh, this event is from 10 to 3. So it's during the day. We're hoping to get that lunch hour traffic of people wanting to eat healthier foods. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, so we know that Brooklyn, while we think it is the center of the universe, is not the only place in the universe. Um, so most of our initiatives are actually citywide. So when we're pushing for Meatless Mondays in schools, in hospitals, homeless shelters, jails, that's citywide. We don't break it down by borough. Um, and actually, our plant-based lifestyle medicine program, because of the doctor we teamed up with, Dr. Michelle McMacken, she was already at Bellevue in Manhattan, and she had been there for the past decade. We weren't about to rip her out and put her in a Brooklyn hospital just because we love Brooklyn so much. So that program has actually piloted in Manhattan, though we are pushing for its expansion in all h, &H facilities. And there are 11 h, &H facilities. Um, so over the, the next few years, we hope to see more and more open up because obviously, as you see with the 650 people on the waiting list, there is demand there. Any other questions about our broader health work? And I'm so happy I took as long as I did so that the room is full for Dr. Dunayev. So without further ado, the doctor you saw in the video was uh, the borough president's doctor. And the borough president's doctor is Dr. David Dunayev. So with that. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the talk. Um, in October, I'm going to Portugal, so you can hear me talk in Portugal. No, I'm not actually talking in Portugal. But what's really interesting is that in April, April 25th of this year, um, the government of Portugal passed a law that every single restaurant in the country, not just in the city, not just in Lisbon, not just in Porto, but in the country, has to offer a vegan option in every restaurant. So this is incentive for New York to offer a vegan, rest, a vegan option in every restaurant. Um, but I'm not pushing that. I'm just hinting at that. Not so subtly. Anyway, so I'll get to the talk because I'm not very good at politics. Um, so anyway, this is reversing and preventing chronic disease with a healthy vegan diet. So how many people, can I see a show of hands, how many people, not to point people out, how many people are vegan in this population? Okay. And that's wonderful. How many people are vegetarian? Okay. Great. And how many people are just people? <laughs> Wait, you guys didn't all show your hands? We have aliens in here? Anyway, okay, so let's go on with the talk. Um, so the objectives of the talk will be debunking the bunk about carbohydrates and proteins. And I thought I'd look at it through carbohydrates and uh, proteins because these are the questions that uh, people get asked all the time, whether you're vegan or you're not vegan, uh, it doesn't really matter. And differentiate among proteins, explain why counting carbs is not, and I say not, important on a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and identify dietary commonalities among chronic disease-free societies. Chronic disease-free societies would be societies such as the Blue Zone. The Blue Zone diets um, are Okinawa, the Seventh-day Adventists that Rachel mentioned, that having a meeting here September 18th. And those are societies where they typically live about a decade longer than we do. 10 years, 12 years, and it's really disease-free for most part. And when you think about it, you say, well, 10, 12 years, that's not much. But then you think to yourself, well, how long does a dog live? So it's 
quite a lot of time when you think about 10, 12 years of disease-free life. And so what we're hoping to do is go beyond the 10, 12 years. We're hoping to go beyond the 90s into the hundreds. And we're hoping to make a big difference and we're hoping to have quality of life throughout so that one day you just keel over when you're done. And that's disease free. So this is the current USDA guidance and this is the plate they have. They have fruits, vegetables, grains, protein and dairy in case you can't read it. Now in terms of this, um, when it comes to protein, they do offer plant-based proteins, but the plate we need to change. We obviously need to change, and we need to have plant proteins, or the term protein where people don't automatically think animal protein. Um, and then as far as dairy goes, you might say, well, I don't drink milk, but they offer nut milks and soy milks and everything else, but you have to read in the small little print in the bottom. If you look very carefully, they do offer it, but we need to change this perception of this plate. So let's talk about the myths uh, about protein. First, let's define what protein actually is. Protein is an essential macronutrient that provides, but not all food sources of protein are created equal, and you may not need as much as you think. So protein is an essential macronutrient. It means it's a large nutrient. It means it has calories. And so the first myth, it's hard to get enough protein with a plant-based diet. And of course, we know that's not true. And when we say, but what about the protein? Everybody asks when you say a whole food plant-based diet, they say, but where's the protein? Are you going to get enough protein? Are you going to be deficient? My little Johnny needs to grow up with a lot of protein. And the problem is we're obsessed with protein. And that it comes from World War II when we were rationing food. And we're still obsessed with protein. So you can get just as much plant-based protein as you can animal-based protein. And the standard for protein is about 0.5 grams per kilogram to 0.8. Um, but you never see a deficiency, really, in the developed world. You never see people with Quashikers disease. This is where they have these bellies and they're super thin. And you never see that in the developing world. I've never seen, I've treated about 1,500 patients now in my practice. And I've never seen one who's been deficient in protein. I've seen a little bit of insufficiency, but never deficiency in protein. And so that number is really not relevant. What's more relevant is that we eat food. And the protein sources, the animal sources are obvious. And then the plant sources, you may or may not know, nuts, beans, bean pasta, bean spaghetti, tofu, legumes. Legumes, so you know, are, um, when you're thinking about it, uh, legumes are uh, lentils, and they're all different types of lentils, and there are also garbanzo beans and things like that. Uh, vegetables, green vegetables, mushrooms have protein, believe it or not, whole grains have protein. Um, so when we look at foods with protein, we are comparing the different types of foods. You see that almonds has the same amount as bean pasta, and, uh, which has the same amount as ground beef, which has the same amount as chicken. So it doesn't mean you have to eat animal protein in order to get enough protein in your body. Having said that, what are the benefits and risks of animal protein? Well, the benefits of animal protein are obvious. It's protein. We need protein, right? But the risks are inflammation. Inflammation is the basis for chronic disease. 80 plus percent of chronic disease, like heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Have you heard of any of these? All of these are based on inflammation. And so then we have atherosclerosis or plaques in your arteries. This again comes from heart disease. And then there's acidity and you can't change the pH of your body. Anybody who says they can change the pH of your body is silly because you can't change the pH. The pH of your body is 7.4, which is a little basic. Over seven is basic, seven is neutral, but you can change the pH of your urine and you can change the bicarb that protects your esophagus. So you can change from acidic to alkaline, but you can actually change the pH of your body more than like two tenths or you go into something called a coma. Um, and then there's saturated fat, and then there's the lack of fiber. Tell me any animal protein, name one. Can anyone name one that has fiber in it? Does anyone dare name an animal protein that has fiber in it? 
and there isn't any animal protein that contains fiber. And fiber, when we were talking about the Blue Zone diets that I talked about, the Okinawa, the Seventh-day Adventists, what they had in common was having a lot of fiber, regardless of what they were eating. And then, of course, weight gain, lack of energy, and heme iron. Heme iron is blood iron. And when iron gets wet, does anyone know what happens when iron gets wet? It Right, and another word for that is oxidizes. I heard some mumbling, and oxidize cause free radical, which causes tissue breakdown. So then we go on to what uh, um, organs it affects, and it basically affects every organ in the body, including the kidneys, the heart, the skin, the liver, the eyes, the lungs, and the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome, in order to grow, requires fiber, and fiber is so important. And when you have an animal-based diet, and predominantly animal-based, you do not get this fiber. You do not get the prebiotic and the probiotic. And if you take a pill and you take a probiotic, it has 10 strains of something that you don't know if you need or have too much of or are lacking or what it is. But you want to get it from food. So chronic diseases that develop from animal protein, cardiovascular disease, where you have plaques in your arteries, Chronic kidney disease, the more protein you eat, if you really pound the animal protein, you get some nitrogenous waste, which happens also in plant protein, but you get something called phosphorus. Phosphorus is poisonous to the kidney. So the higher the phosphorus level goes, the worse it does for the kidney function. So if you want someone to do better who either has chronic kidney disease or is in jeopardy of chronic kidney disease, drop the animal protein down and then it'll do much better. Uh, diabetes, the risk, and I'll talk about that. There's a Seventh-day Adventist trial talking about that. And the autoimmune diseases, and uh, cancers, and obesity, and kidney stones. You get kidney stones from dehydration, but you also get kidney stones from animal protein. And you get, what happens is you end up with calcium in your um, kidneys, and then you have high cholesterol and high blood pressure, and then of course erectile dysfunction, which is related to a lot of times heart disease. A lot of men who have heart disease also have erectile dysfunction, and that's because blood vessels are in the penis as they are in the heart. So it's not just one place that you have problems, and you have PAD, peripheral artery disease, which is the same thing as saying yeah, I have heart disease, which is the same thing as saying I have erectile dysfunction, and all of that is what we used to call a vasculopath because there's 230 miles of blood vessels. You think just one area is going to be affected by what you eat. That's not going to be the case. So when we look at this, the benefits of plant protein are basically the opposite of the harm of animal protein. So when we look at this, plant proteins reduce inflammation. And again, I mentioned that inflammation is the basis of most chronic diseases. And then there's reversing plaques and there's alkalinity. So alkalinity, when you have more alkaline instead of acidic, you reduce the risk of things like reflux disease and you help protect the kidneys. And then, of course, there's weight loss and everybody wants energy. Energy is great. And we always want to be young, and we want to do what we want to do. And then there's something, well, in real estate, they say location, location, location. In whole food plant-based, we say fiber, 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 because fiber is so important. And everything that has fiber has protein, and everything that has fiber has carbohydrates. I dare you to name unprocessed, that is. I dare you to name, I found one. Someone showed me noodles from Japan that were processed that had actual fiber and no protein, but they were totally processed. But OK, so that was one. But I dare you to find another one where there's no protein when you have fiber. And then you have low fat, and it's good fats, and you have low saturated fats. Um, so myth two, if you want lots of muscle, you must eat animal protein. And of course, that's not true either, because you've got a gorilla. And a gorilla doesn't eat animal protein. And you've got an elephant. And I know elephants are very small. They're only average about 14,000 pounds. And of course, so that tells you that you, know, you shouldn't be eating plant protein because it doesn't get you larger than an elephant. And if you need to be larger than an elephant, well, can't help you there. Um, so professional athletes. There are professional athletes who are now plant-based who do much better. They last much longer on the playing field. If you know or know anything about football or know anything about the Patriots who keep winning, um, Tom Brady 
is being, playing till he's 42, maybe 43, maybe 44, but he's 42 now and he's one of the top three quarterbacks. No quarterback has ever made it past 37. Why? Because he's on a plant-based, mostly plant-based diet. So then, are all plant proteins good for you? Or all plant proteins are good for you because it's plants, right? Plants are good for you, all of them, of course, right? Well, beware of processed plant proteins. Beware of textured vegetable protein. Beware of soy protein isolates. Anything you ultra process, whether it's plants or it's animals, are not good for you. So be careful of that. So let's use um, this example. There was a study coronary heart disease study. <clears throat> what you see is that animal foods are the red line. And above that uh, line that goes out, above the x-axis where it's uh, 1.0, um, the red line goes up. And that means the risk of heart disease goes up. And so you say to yourself, well, what do we expect? You've been telling us that plant protein is better than animal protein. And you see that that dotted yellow line which is healthy plant foods, goes down, which means the risk of heart disease goes down. But what's surprising is, you see that dotted line above the red line, that's unhealthy plant foods. So if you think all plant foods are the same and they're all healthy, think again. Because the people who are eating only unhealthy vegan or vegetarian or whatever plant foods, it can be more unhealthy than animal food. So what you really want to do is, so you say to yourself, well, then let me eat animal protein. No, what you really want to do is you want to reduce the risk. You don't want to raise the risk above animal protein. You want to reduce the risk. So yes, eating, not eating animals for ethical reasons is a great thing. Let's add to it and not eat necessarily animal protein or not that often because it helps you with your health. And then that also saves something called the environment and the planet. So this is a great study to show that. Now, an example of unhealthy um, plant food is Impossible Burger. If you look at it, I just took out some of the ingredients. I wasn't sure what the heck they were. So soy protein concentrate, that's basically ultra-processed soy. Coconut oil, sunflower oil, potato protein. Potato protein is not potato. It's this processed kind of stuff. Cultured dextrose means sugar that's been modified. I don't know how. Food starch, it's been modified. Now, soy leg hemoglobin just has been approved by the FDA. And it's genetically modified plant hemoglobin to look like blood. So if you want your food to look like blood, just cut your finger and bleed on the hamburger. No, don't eat the hamburger. Don't cut your finger. I was just joking about all of that. But you don't want modified blood. Um, and then there's salt, and then there's soy protein isolate. And then if you look at the nutrition facts, you see that, first of all, there's 14 grams of fat. And how many grams, can someone yell, how many grams of saturated fat? Right, eight grams of saturated fat. That's tremendous. And how much sodium? 370. And how much fiber? Well, it has three grams. That's good. At least it has some fiber, but that's probably added fiber. And this is dried plant food, and we'll talk about that as well. So let's go on from there. And what does the research say? So this first one that says animal protein and heart disease in China. I was at uh, Neil Barnard's conference, uh, PCRM, Physician Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is really a great group for um, a vegan idea and protection of animals, and I think that's wonderful. Um, but there was a Chinese doctor presenting at the end, and I'm thinking, what do I need a Chinese doctor for? I'm not practicing in China, I'm practicing here. I know that this is worldly, but it's not China. Um, and so what he did was he took a, two mimeographs and he put one over the other um, inlays, and what you saw was that when the animal protein went up, the heart disease went up almost identically in China. That doesn't mean that the smog and everything else isn't the cause of heart disease, but all of a sudden, heart disease has gone up when they've had smog. This, that's not a study, but I thought it was very interesting. And then there's reversing heart disease by Esselstein, there's reversing um, plaques by Ornish and Esselstein, and then there's the seven-day Aventis trial, and then there's the Finnish meat study. So the Esselstein uh, study took heart patients, 24 heart patients, 18 of them were adherent. That meant they followed what they were supposed to do. 
Um, and they were following a whole food, plant-based diet, and one of them dropped out, so there were 17. And he followed them for five years and 12 years, and from what I understand, he's been following them for more than 18 years. It's a very small study, but it's really long duration. All patients had severe heart disease, and when it says angiographically, that means they looked at it with a dye so they could see how bad the heart disease was. So these were patients with severe heart disease. And it was a plant-based diet, and it included fruits, vegetables, legumes, beans, less than 10% calories from fat, and eliminated all animal protein. And the adherent group, or the compliant group, had 73% 73, uh, 73 had reversal of their plaques in their arteries. What drug can reverse plaques in your arteries? What drug? None. There are none that can do that. And the cholesterol dropped from a total of 237 to 137. And in the Framingham Heart Study, it said if the cholesterol was less than 150, you were doing much better and your risk of cardiovascular disease went way down. And so the non-adherent group in 12 to 18 months had 13 cardiac events Six people had 13 cardiac events. So that just shows you that switching this, I agree, 13 cardiac events is not good. So um, then what they complained about was this study was too small. So Caldwell Esselstyn went and said, okay, I'll do a larger study. There were 198 patients, 177 of them were adherent. So 21 became the control group because they were non-adherent. So this was a 3.7 years that they did this study. And of the adherent group, 0.6% had an event, had a lacunar stroke, the one patient. And it wasn't even clear whether that actually occurred at that time or whether they actually had a lacunar stroke many years earlier. Nobody's sure. But say it did happen. So that's 0.6% versus 62% of the population had cardiovascular events. Let me ask you, do you want 0.6 or do you want 62%? And the answer is a no-brainer. Hopefully you won't pick 62. So this is coronary artery disease. This is 32 months after on a plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet. And this was using Caldwell Esselstyn's angiogram. And what it shows is this is the left anterior descending artery in your heart. Let me give you another term for it. It's called the widow maker. So in other words, when someone has a heart attack and they have a massive heart attack and they drop dead, that's the artery they drop dead because it's blocked. So when that's withered like that, that shows the blockage. And 32 months later, it looks like a new artery. So that is amazing. And that just comes from eating a whole food plant-based diet. So then I have an anecdotal story. What would I be without an anecdotal story in my research? So there was a 70-year-old um, man who had blockage um, with a CT angiogram of 60 to 80 percent. And the cardiologist wanted to do a catheter. And if the blockage was 75 percent or more, he wanted to place a stent. A stent is a metal object like looks like a fence and you push against the um, clot so that it doesn't break off and so that helps. But a stent is only a few millimeters. So remember, there are 230 miles of arteries. So if you're covering a few millimeters and you have 230 miles, that's not very much. So anyway, he wanted to put a stent. And the patient had high blood pressure and had visceral fat that's fat around your organs. Not fat around your belly, but actually inside your organs, around your organs, inside. Not just your belly, but around your organs. And had 21 on the visceral fat. It should be less than 13. So he had almost double. And his fat percent was 37%, and it should have been less than 22%. So he was quite a lot of fat in his body. So he decided, and he was a patient who would go on and off meds because he'd be c compliant, then not compliant, then compliant, then not compliant. Then he decided a switch went off, and he said, I'm going to follow what you say because I don't want to get this stent. So he followed what I said, and two months later, after adhering to a much better whole food plant-based diet, I'm about to unveil called the Life Diet. This is something that I just came up with after 10 years of working with Dr. Furman, and this is a modified Dr. Furman diet. After caring for um, my own patients for 10 years, I came up with the Life Diet, and I will explain more about it uh, later on. But he lost 19 pounds, 12 pounds of fat, and the energy level was great, 
and in the conversation he said a switch went off and I said I was going to follow this and it made all the difference in the world and he had no more need for the stent according to the nuclear stress test. So that's very important and the nuclear stress test is one of the gold standards. So then this is a trial done with stents. This is to show how important stents are or really aren't. And this is called the Orbiter trial. And in the Orbiter trial, they had narrowing of the blood vessel to 85%. And what they had was severe coronary blockage. And so when they put stents in 100 people and they didn't put stents in the other 100 people, they did catheters where they put wires into your um, femoral artery and they went up and they put the wire through and then some of them got the stent and some didn't and this was done in England. In the United States that's called unethical. Apparently it's not unethical in England. Anyway, the difference in six weeks was that there was no difference in symptoms. It didn't matter whether you got the stent electively or you didn't. You got 16 seconds more exercise. That means you could walk from here probably to that door and that was the only difference. So. The stent is not the lifesaver. And then there's the Dean Ornish heart study where he showed regression of plaques over a five-year period. And there were 48 patients. It was, again, a whole food plant-based diet. 20 were in the experimental and 15 in the control. And what we saw was a widening of the blood vessel by 7.9%. Now, you say 7.9% isn't that large. But compared to the group, and we can do better than that now, but compared to that group, the control group had almost a 30% narrowing compared to a 7.9% widening and had twice as many cardiac events. And it's not by accident that it's in red. Um, and then there's the Adventist Health Study 2. This is the seventh day Adventist trial. Um, and it was with a whole bunch of people. And um, what happened, what they saw, and this is a very confusing slide. I want you to memorize all the numbers and come back to me and draw it out for me. But what it really shows is that most of the groups ate very few servings of animal protein. The group that was vegan ate less than, um, ate meats less than once a month. The group that was lacto-vegetarian less than once a month. The um, people who ate fish had it either equal to once a month or a little bit more. But anytime they do a comparison with diets, like a plant-based or any kind of other one, and they compare it to the standard American diet, any diet is better than the standard American diet. So you're going to get great results when you compare it to the standard American diet. But this differentiated between very small, among very small number of changes. And what you found was that there were significant differences. The risk of diabetes went down by 49% in the vegan group and went down in the lacto-ovo by 54, which means milk and eggs, went down in the fish eating group by 30%. So that's very important. It shows that a vegan diet, a vegan healthy diet is the best. Now, do you have to be vegan? Close your ears, David. You don't have to be vegan to make improvements, but being vegan and being a healthy vegan is the best diet on the planet. So for more information about the Seventh-day Adventist health study, you can go on their site and you can see information about colon polyps, longevity, metabolic syndrome, in other words, living longer. So again, a vegan diet is the healthiest diet if it's a healthy vegan diet. So then we have the Finnish meat study, which was 22 years in duration, and it looked at people who ate half a pound or more of red meat versus less than a quarter pound. And what they found was there was a 23% increased risk in something small. It's a one-time side effect, I always say, death, because you don't come back from it. So if you don't mind a one-time side effect that you don't come back from, that's what you get. And um, so it, the conclusion was don't eat meat every day. So that shows you that meat may increase the risk of death. So, and then this was a medication trial, and I show this because it was a medication for chronic kidney disease. And what they called it, the nephrologists, the kidney doctors called it, they called it a game changer. Because what happened was the medication reduced the risk of progression to end stage kidney disease when you're on dialysis or death by 30% in mild patients, in very mild patients who had kidney function that was very mildly low. And that's 30%. So let me go to the next slide. 
all-cause mortality and chronic kidney disease based on a whole food, plant-based vegan diet. And this vegan diet showed, it was observational with 14,000 patients, and it was a uh, plant. And what it showed was for each 33% increase in plant protein to total protein, you had a 23% decrease in mortality risk. So if 33%, every 33% you replace with plants, imagine if you replaced 100% with plants, you get about a 70% reduction in death. Remember I showed you the medication that said 30% reduction in more mild patients, and they called that a game changer. So plants are very, very powerful, and just by going vegan, it's very powerful. So just remember this for kidney function. And then for an anecdotal story, I had an 88-year-old whose goal was to avoid dialysis. He was in stage four, borderline stage five chronic kidney disease. What does stage five mean? It means you're either on dialysis or you get a transplant. So either way, he was on the border of that. He was, GFR was 15. If it went down to 14, he was in stage five. So his symptoms were shortness of breath when going upstairs, and he had um, other things like high blood pressure and anemia, and his father died of a stroke and his mother died of a stroke. So it really shows that he has problems, family history problems. He went on a whole food plant-based diet called the Life Diet. He stopped the animal protein. In six weeks, his kidney function went up 40%. In 12 weeks, his kidney function went up 53.3%. Show me a drug that, reduce, what, that increases your function of your kidney. There aren't any. What drugs do is potentially reduce the risk, and the game changer was the 30%. This actually increased the function of his kidneys. And so he had significant improvement in shortness of his breath, so he wasn't running out of gas, and not gas coming from the one end, but gas coming from the mouth, um, going up uh, stairs and going up the hill. Ultimately, it's more about the fiber than it is about the protein. So when we look at this, you can quantify this in your urine by looking at different factors. And the one I highlighted was the inflammatory factor of CRP, which is C-reactive protein. And you can look at nutrient levels called beta carotene in the blood. And as that goes up, um, the inflammatory factor hopefully goes down. So the myths, it's hard to get enough protein with plant-based diet. If you want lots of muscle, you must eat animal protein. And all plant protein is good for you has been debunked. So the myths about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are any various neutral compounds, hydrogen, oxygen, most of which are formed by green plants. And I got this from a very fancy place called a dictionary. All carbs are created equal. And we know that's not true. So when we look at this, we don't just eat macronutrients in isolation. We don't just eat carbohydrates. When people say, I'm not eating carbohydrates, well, the only food that's just carbohydrates is pure sugar. And I don't know about you, but I'm not eating pure sugar all day. So there's a difference between that fruit and that uh, cereal. And that cereal, that cereal was processed. So as far as fruits go, should you avoid bananas? And the answer is no. Bananas do not raise your sugar. And I had a patient who was a 9-11 first responder. And I always talk about him in the past tense, like I lost the patient. I still have the patient. But anyway, um, I have the patient, and he's, uh, he was eating five bananas a day. And he has PTSD, so he decided to eat 10 bananas a day and see what would happen. And he said, could I do that for a month? I said, sure. I don't know anybody who eats 10 bananas a day, but go ahead, go ape. And so he ate 10 bananas a day, and his sugars went up mildly. So I said, okay, go back to five bananas a day and stop there. So the moral of the story is don't eat more than five bananas a day. <laughs> the fruits make it hard to lose weight. I've had two fruitarians in my practice, and they are so thin. They have no meat on their bones, and they are so thin. So the answer is fruit does not cause you to gain weight. And... Um, it does not make it hard to lose weight either, and it does not raise your sugar. Studies actually show it reduces the risk of diabetes. So it's about the quality of the carbohydrates. So carbs that raise your sugars versus carbs that don't, and processed foods raise your sugars, and starchy vegetables can possibly do that, and fruit juice, and dried fruit, and honey, um, and carbs that don't include fruits and non-starchy vegetables, beans, legumes, bean pasta, bean spaghetti, tofu, and possibly whole grains. It depends on your, how your body responds. 
I always like to say no body is the same. Not no body, but no body, because everybody responds differently. So if you look at these bean pastas, you see that this is um, a edamame bean pasta, and it has 20 grams of carbohydrates, but it has 13 grams of fiber, and so, and 24 grams of protein. It doesn't raise your sugars. Forget the numbers, just remember, bean pasta doesn't raise your sugars if it's just pure bean pasta. Don't put brown rice in it or anything else, but pure bean pasta doesn't raise your sugars. This one has 53 carbs. And you say, what are you, nuts? That's 53 carbs. Why would you give it to someone with diabetes? Because it doesn't raise the sugars. It has protein, it has fiber, and it is a bean. And that has phytonutrients, and I'll explain that in a minute. But phytonutrients are plant nutrients. And then this one is a high quality whole grain. And this one does raise your sugars. Even though it's a high quality whole grain, it still raises your sugars. And that's what you want to be careful about. It has 41 grams of carbohydrates and seven grams of protein. So it has less protein, same amount of carbohydrates, but it raises your sugars. And it's the quality of carb that matters. So that's. So I'll, I'll answer questions at the end. Let me just finish so that we don't distract from that. But so the quality of carbs are very important. So this is a, not a very good pasta. This is more like your white pasta. And this um, tends to raise your sugars. So the studies, carbohydrate replacement study. There are 24 participants. It was this randomized control trial. Randomized control just means it's a very good study. And they replaced carbs from rice and potato with cooked lentils. And what they found was when they replaced them with lentils, which are legumes or beans, they found the impact on the sugar went down by 35% and 20%. That means that the sugar goes down with the bean as opposed to the rice and the potato. So replacing rice and potatoes with lentils has a significant positive impact on blood sugar. The energy expenditure study, this is a really cool study. This was done by David, Dink uh, da David Jenkins, I want to say David Dinkins, not the mayor. David Jenkins, sorry. I'm in New York, what can I do? Um, anyway, the carbohydrates, the total energy expenditure study, low carbohydrate diet, it was about a low carbohydrate diet, and they had 164 adults, and they had a run-in diet where they lost 12% of their weight, uh, body fat, or not body fat, but actually weight. So they lost 12% of their weight. So they got weight out of the question. So that wasn't part of the dynamic. And what they were given were high carbs and low carbs. Forget about the moderate carbs. The high carbs were mashed potato and rice. The low carbs were string beans and mashed cauliflower. And they used something called doubly labeled water to measure it, which is the gold standard. But what's really impressive here is that when you compared the high carb to the low carb, the low carbohydrate diet burned 209 to 308 extra calories a day just by eating the exact same number of calories. So if you're eating 1,500 calories a day, or whatever it is, and you're eating the exact same number of calories, you're not cutting a potato in half and saying, I'm not going to eat that extra half of the potato, and so I'm going to be hungry. This is eating the exact same number of carbs, but yet you're burning more calories. And then, so not all calories are created equal, and that's the importance of it. And then they had another study comparing brown rice to white rice. And what they found, they were looking at inflammatory factor, the C-reactive protein, and cardiovascular risk in young women. And what they found was that um, in this group, there were six weeks on brown rice or six weeks on white rice. And six weeks on brown rice, then two weeks of washout period, and six weeks on ri white rice or vice versa. And so when they did this study, what they found was that the inflammation went up with the white rice instead of the brown rice. So you'd say brown rice was better. But what's interesting about this is if you look at group one and two on the inflammation, the two week washout period on group two at the bottom of the screen had the inflammation go down as fast as the six weeks of brown rice. So it wasn't necessarily that brown rice was better than white rice, it was that maybe no rice was better than any rice. So the conclusion was sort of suspect. And then low carbohydrates are um, healthiest, and we're gonna just fly through this. 
Um, the high carbohydrate versus the high fat group, what this showed was that high fats um, were better than high carbohydrates. However, however, the high fat, uh, carb the high carbohydrate group had white flour, white sugar, cube sugar, and soda. So it was high fat compared to junk food. So what you want to learn from this study is what are they comparing it to? And that's the importance of this study. And so again, this one's showing that low carbohydrate group is increased mortality, but when they replaced it with plant-based protein, they had less mortality. So again, it's not about high carb, low carb, it's about quality of carb. And in this case, this was an anecdotal story from my practice that showed that someone who was having plant-based with beans and everything else could have a plant-based ketogenic effect, burning ketones, and that's what urine trace ketones means. And this is just what you can measure based on sugars in your blood. So this is just myths debunked, and then implementing what we've learned is that health equals nutrient to calorie ratio, where that's very important, and that came from working with Dr. Joel Furman, who wrote Eat to Live, and then um, you want to focus on phytochemicals, which are plant-based chemicals that have an anti-inflammatory effect or antioxidants, and fiber is very important, and don't just avoid fat because 70% of the brain is made up of fat, just don't overeat it. And then the life diet. This is what I told you I'd uh, just spend a few minutes on. The life diet is what we call the low inflammatory foods everyday diet. It involves dark leafy greens, focused on elevating the beta carotene in the blood and reducing the inflammation, the CRP, and it's smoothies, large salads, dark green leafy vegetables in soups, beans, bean pasta, legumes, steamed, roasted, grilled, or sauteed vegetables, and limited grains and starchy vegetables. So what we did was we submitted a study two weeks ago to get published in a medical journal with 43 patients, 22 who followed it, 21 who did not, with six months. And what we were looking at was what happens when the beta carotene levels, what happens with adherent patients with the beta carotene levels, and what happens with the inflammation. And what we saw was people who followed the life diet that the adherent patients had beta carotene levels, nutrient levels in the blood that were much higher, 100 compared to 27. And so what we found with those who had inflammation based on subjective adherence, telling me they were adherent and we were describing it, we found that the inflammation was much, much higher in the non-adherent group. So the CRP, which is inflammation, again, the basis of most chronic disease. And then objectively, the same thing happened. There was more inflammation in the group that didn't follow the diet than in the group that did, and it was really um, highly statistically significant. So the moral of the story is plant-based proteins are the healthiest. Health, the healthy versus unhealthy vegan, it makes a big difference. And then not all carbohydrates are created equal, and we don't just eat macronutrients in isolation. In other words, we don't just eat carbohydrates in isolation. And so these are some resources, if you care, about Eat to Live, How Not to Die. Michael Greger's wonderful. Joel Furman's wonderful. Michael Pollan writes for the New York Times. Nutritionfacts.org is a video that Michael Greger does, and he does two or three minutes um, every um, day or every week, and they're wonderful. And then PCRM, and then Plant Powered Metro New York is a uh, group right here in New York. and. Um, it's led in Manhattan, but it's all over. It's in Brooklyn, it's in Queens, it's in Staten Island. You can get involved. It's a really wonderful group. It's all over the place. And I just wanted to end with, if we could give everybody, every individual, the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, we would have found the safest way to health. And Hippocrates said this in about 5 BC. And it's taken us this long to catch up. So thank you very much. So on, on folks' way out, we have two resources. Because uh, resources are hard to come by, I ask that you pick up one. Um, one is the African American Vegan Starter Guide, and one is the Humane Society's The Guide to Plant-Based Meals. So they are, they are here on your way out. We have time for Q&A, so we'll take a few questions before we break. Um, Cheryl, by all means. Hold on a second. Do we have ah. another mic?
He's going to grab a mic so he can record this. Okay, let's get a closer question in the meantime. Oh, okay. In which case, Cheryl. I'll go with Cheryl. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Yes. I said I am plant-based, and I agree totally for many reasons that, you know, everything you said about the plant-based diet. But I always know also that when we're on a plant-based diet, we also must get all our amino acids, a complete protein. And beans and peas, since they are not uh, complete proteins, usually you have to complement it with something else. And I was always, one of the things I was always told was brown rice. And I heard you said no rice. No rice might be better. So I want to ask you, what are the things that complement with the beans and peas to get that complete protein? I didn't actually say that you should not eat um, any grains. I'm saying that. No, not grains. You were talking about. No, no grains, wrong right, grains, wrong right. grains. Yeah, grains. Okay. So grains, not greens, grains. Um, but I'm not actually saying you shouldn't eat grains. All I was saying was that in that study, the study didn't actually say that brown rice was, uh, it was a better option than white rice, but it suggested it might be an option not to have rice at all and you would get the inflammation to go down. But the thing about um, complete amino acids is that if you eat um, fruits and vegetables and uh, beans and bean pasta and everything else, you'll get um, the amino acids you need you don't find that people are deficient in these type of amino acids. There might be some people who have a few deficiencies here and there, but measuring them also is quite unreliable in terms of measuring them in labs. The labs that measure amino acids don't always give you the greatest numbers and don't always mean anything. I don't know what it means in terms of um, some labs going out there and not being standardized, but they sometimes measure amino acids and say, well, we want the complete amino acid. But we don't have, it doesn't seem like there are problems with people having um, issues with not getting enough protein and not getting the complete amino acid, because you can get it from- From the other whole grains. Fruits, well, you can get it from whole grains, but you can also get it from fruits and vegetables and beans in combination. Fruits and vegetables have what beans lack. So you get all of it. I'm not saying you, don't, you can't have grains. I'm just saying limit the amount of grains, especially for people who have diabetes. The, not for everybody. The, Go ahead. The front row. Go ahead. I was under the impression that complex carbohydrates, including whole grains, like whole grain pasta, mm -hmm. was much better for you than, say, white pasta. And then you mentioned that one whole grain that was in the box yeah, and that's a good, great question. And everything is relative to everything else. So, so whole grain pasta is better than white pasta. It definitely is. It gives you some fiber. But bean pasta is better than whole grain pasta because you don't see the sugars go up when you measure the sugars. And I've seen this in my practice. You don't see the sugars go up after you have um, uh, beans, but you see the sugars go up much higher with whole grains, especially with patients who are more apt toward having high insulin levels and patients who are more apt toward diabetes. And it would be great if there were a study done, and there hasn't been one, that compares beans and bean pasta to whole grains. There's been a study comparing bean pasta to whole grains, but there hasn't been a study comparing beans to whole grains. So I see the next study coming along, and that's what it should okay, be. And what other things? I was a, a lot of uh, nutritionists uh, say that sweet potatoes, which is a starchy vegetable, mm -hmm. happen to be incredibly nourishing. Mm -hmm. And you're saying no starchy vegetables. Uh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not limit saying them. right. Limit the starchy vegetables, but but that happens to be like I I think that that's very conflicting to to what I've read and understood. So what I see happening is when it comes to inflammation, is that starchy vegetables like sweet potatoes raise the beta carotene level in your blood, but they don't actually reduce the inflammation. They actually mask the fact that it's raising the nutrient levels, but the actual inflammation is not coming down. Like when you take it with dark green leafy vegetables. And which is healthier, a sweet potato that's, a sweet potato or a white potato? 
And the answer is, both of them can raise your sugars, but the white potato has less sugar than the sweet potato by five grams. And the beta carotene that makes the sweet potato sweet is what raises your sugar. Now, let me change, let me flip that around. What is a sweet potato? It's a root vegetable. So how do you eat root vegetables so it doesn't raise your sugars and potentially get the nutrients? Raw. So if you eat a carrot and it's a root vegetable and it's raw, it doesn't raise your sugars. But once you cook a carrot, it raises your sugars. And you see that all the time, that cooked carrots are a starchy vegetable that raise your sugars. So if you can, and I've had this before, you shave pumpkin and you shave it just like a carrot and you eat it raw, it's not gonna raise your sugars and you're gonna get the benefit of what a pumpkin has. But as soon as you cook it, it breaks down into the starches and you start getting higher levels of sugar. Can, is this a problem even if you don't have Sugar issues? Well, it's a problem if um, the question becomes, who is it a problem for? And it, like I said, you can have, I'm not saying don't have, I'm saying have it in a limited amount. So you can have a serving a day or two servings a day, but don't have much more than that. But it's a problem for people who want to lose weight. It's a problem who, for people who have higher insulin levels. It's a problem for people with diabetes. It's a problem for people who have pre-diabetes. And it's a so it plays a factor in a lot of people's roles, and it also can create, after eating it, eat a whole large sweet potato, and then see an hour later whether you have fatigue or not. And if you don't have fatigue, then that would suggest that the sugar doesn't play as much role for you. But if you eat it, that's a simple test to do that. If you eat it, and then an hour later you're a little bit tired, or you feel like you're getting tired, that tells you your sugars went up, and then your insulin spiked as well. And so that tells you that the sweet potato has too much sugar cooked. Okay, we have time for two more questions, and then the doctor is going to stay here after, so there'll be plenty of time for folks to come up uh, and speak with him after. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name's Michael. I've been vegan for 30 years. Congratulations. And thank you. Um, I, I gained, I was at about 172 pounds last, uh, about a year ago. I started going to the gym and I cut out potatoes, rice, and bread. And I got down to like 159. So I have a couple quick questions, uh, two word, three word questions. Uh, smart dogs, veggie dogs, I'm eating a lot of those. And how do you measure how much salt is healthy? Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, and great. thank you for all this information. Well, thank, thank you for coming. Um, great questions, two great questions. One, veggie dogs are, even the purest, are not the greatest because they're still processed. That doesn't mean, and like I said with the sweet potato, doesn't mean you can't have them. But veggie dogs you'd want to have like once a week. Sweet potato you could have every day, you just don't want to have a lot of it. But veggie dogs you could have once a day. Um, I mean, uh, veggie dogs you could have once a week. Yeah, like one or two once a week type. Not three a day like you're eating, no. Try not. I have a patient who stays on the diet I've given him because he said, I need to have those veggie dogs and I need to have the sauerkraut once a week and then I feel okay for the rest of the week and I'm happy. And I said, okay, go for it. You know, what keeps you on the diet, whatever makes you change. And it's moving the dial. Some people will move the dial all the way over. Other people will move the dial 50%. I say, if you're 50% adherent, to the lifestyle changes, you're okay. If you're 75%, you're good. If you're 90%, you're excellent. And if you're 100%, you're lying. <laughs> okay. Now, about the salt, about the salt. The way you can look at salt is that salt plays a role in blood pressure, but it also plays a role in swelling, and it also plays a role in heart disease. And so you want to be very careful about the salt. And the salt, in terms of the blood levels, range from, basically in the blood, from 135 to 145. And when people are south of 140, that means less than um, 140, 139, 138, they do the best. So say you have high blood pressure, and your salt is 144. And you say, but salt's not my problem with blood pressure. Well, how do we know that if you don't lower the salt? If you don't lower the salt enough in the blood so that it's on the lower end. If you get the salt on the lower end and you're having that amount of salt, then that can be right for you. Should you be aiming for? About 1,500 milligrams would be three quarters of a teaspoon. 
Yeah, a quarter of a teaspoon would be mean, but you know, a lot of it comes from when you go, you have salsa, and you have salsa and it has 100 milligrams of sodium. And you have also dark leafy green vegetables. They have 800 to 900 milligrams of sodium in them just by themselves, but they have complete amount of electrolytes. They have um, potassium, they have chloride, they have all these wonderful things that you're not getting when you're getting a processed product. So I would say 1,500 if you wanted to use the number. And I'd try to get lower is better, but I would not, there was a study that used no sodium in heart failure patients and they started dying. You know why? Because we need salt and we need sugar. We need carbohydrates and we need a little fat and we need protein. We need all of it. We just need it in a certain amount. Hi, um, I am vegetarian too and vegan. I need a question about the, what do you think about bread with yeast? Bread with yeast? With yeast, yes. Yeah, again, um, it's, it can be okay. It depends on the person's body, and it depends on what happens to the sugars, and it depends on what happens to the weight. And the problem is breads don't really offer a ton of nutrients beyond the fiber. But fiber is great, but it doesn't add a ton of nutrients beyond the fiber. There's not a lot of phytonutrients beyond that which comes from bread. And so you want to focus on other foods. And if, say, you eat a ton of greens, and you eat a ton of vegetables, and you eat a ton of fruit, and you eat a ton of beans, and then you want a little piece of bread at the end, and it's not going to cause you to gain weight, and it's not going to cause your sugars to spike, go ahead and have a piece of bread. But you want to put that sort of to the side as sort of when that plate came with the USDA, you want to put that on the milk little plate and say, OK, I'll have that at the end. But it doesn't mean people can have bread. doesn't mean people can have grains. It means that if you potentially want to lose weight and you potentially want to lower your sugars and you potentially want to have more energy where you don't have this energy spike and then this energy crash, cutting back on foods that raise your sugars is the most valuable thing, and that involves starchy vegetables and grains. I'm not talking against whole food grains. I even said it depends on the other side of that chart, that it depends on how it affects you. Go ahead. Ezekiel bread is bread. It's bread. And so I really love what I really love. Last one? OK. Ezekiel bread is my favorite thing. Because what you want to do is you want to get Ezekiel bread that says low salt. It's actually bread with no salt. Eat it. Don't put anything on it. If you enjoy it, eat it all day long because you won't. It tastes like a piece of cardboard <laughs> but without anything on it. But it doesn't actually have a lot of nutrients in it. And it can raise your sugars. And if you want to lose weight or you want to get your sugars down, it depends on who you are. But is it better than eating animal protein? Yes. So if you have a choice between whole grains and animal protein, eat the whole grains. I mean, that, that's, that's wonderful because they do offer fiber and they do offer some nutrients, but they don't offer a huge bevy of nutrients. Uh, if people want to find out more about your life diet, how can they do that? That's a great question. They can. <laughs> well. I'm getting this, um, I have this study being published um, for submission and I'm hoping it gets published in this journal and then there'll be all kinds of data. But I'll put it on my website in more detail. Um, but you can go to my, I was just about to say that, but thank you, Rachel, you're so, your premonition, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, anyway, so my website is Medical Compass I know people always ask me one S or two S's, and I'm like, did you go to grammar school? Compass is spelled with two S's as far as I know, and potato doesn't have an E at the end. So it's medicalcompassmd, as in medicaldoctor.com. So medicalcompassmd.com, um, and we're updating the website and hopefully coming out with a new one within the next month or two. Um, so it'll have more data, and it'll have, but it has a lot of data on it now, and it has a lot of articles, and it has a lot of research. But w the questions you're asking me took me five years to figure out. Five years, because I had been saying how great sweet potato was. And I had been saying how great whole grain breads were. 
five years of seeing, and I see every patient an hour for every time, and I've had 500,000 different data points from labs that I've looked through and seen all the time, and you start to see these trends. And then when I run the research, oh my gosh, now you see a huge difference, and it's not a surprise because I already knew what the trends were gonna be. So just to let you know, those are much better. So it's relative to what? Gregor always says, Michael Gregor always says, what is it relative to? So compared to white bread, is whole grain bread better? better? Yes. Or is Ezekiel bread better? Yes, because it doesn't have all the additives. So if you're going to eat bread, eat Ezekiel bread with no salt. Maybe you just partly answered my second question. If people are interested in either having you as their personal doctor or finding out about that, what, the, what should they do? Well, they can either go to the website or I can give them my business card. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. Also, I have uh, one announcement uh, in the meetup description. I had put that uh, for those who want to, there's going to be dinner at a nearby vegan restaurant afterwards. That restaurant is Luann's Wild Ginger on Smith Street, and you may either get there yourself if you're interested, or we'll be walking over as a group right after this. And how did you learn of that restaurant? I don't know. <laughs> so with that, a round of applause to Dr. David Dunayev. And I think that you guys, I think you guys should give yourselves a round of applause. I love questions that are very difficult, and these questions are very difficult to answer, and these questions are very difficult to answer. They're not your home run, I can easily answer these questions, so I applaud you for thinking about this and asking these. And again, there are two resources to, uh, to take on your way out. Please just take one of them because we are limited on them. So please just take one. If you have any questions about Borough Hall, the Borough President's Office, see me. If you have any questions about medicine, see the doctor. Thank you so much for coming.